Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 224th episode of the CodeCast Podcast. My name is Terry Fletcher. I hope everyone's doing great today. It is February 1st. I can't believe we're already in February, but I love February because it's my daughter's birthday. I get to go visit her in Arizona, and it's always a good month because we're a month into some of the new rules that have come about with Medicare and some of the other payers. So a couple of episodes ago, I did an Uh, something on shared visits. And I got a lot of traction with that. And many of you were like, Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And I went through all the information, really pulled a lot of it from the final rule with Medicare. Well, we're a month into it now. And Medicare chapter 12 of the Medicare manual has now adopted some of those things that came from the final rule. Well, I want to shout out to Michelle Weiss in Michigan. Michelle brought something to my attention. She's at Weiss Oncology Consulting. And I was like, oh my gosh, that can't be correct because out in uh, where Michelle is, they have WPS Medicare. And here in California, we have Noridian and something on the shared visits and split visits. Again, Medicare is what the payer we're talking about. Um, They were very clear in the last training session we have that you have to have a face-to-face, and they alluded to the fact that had to be the physician, which I mentioned in my last Shared Visit podcast. Well, here's the thing. (laughs) I looked through this information, and again, thank you, Michelle, that Michelle sent me, and I hadn't had a chance to look at it Um, prior to that. I looked at, what again, what was in the final rule, and I'm reading through this, and you know what our episode today is called Medicare. What the heck are you thinking? And because I like to keep it clean, I'm not using profanity, but I'm thinking it because as you look through this, and again, it's talking about effective date 1-1 implementation date 215, which is probably why I didn't see it because I knew that they were um, going to be up- updating and changing some things. But here's here's the thing. I don't understand why Medicare would put this out there on the definition of split or shared visit because when they were on their uh, stakeholder calls, when we talked about some of the updates uh, when it came to um, the uh, final rule, they were basically taking a lot of feedback and people said, well, wait a minute, you know, this isn't, this doesn't sound right because it looks like you're just trying to get your 85% uh, reimbursement or or that's what you're trying to send to the, the provider's offices instead of actually capture what the physician's doing who's actually liable for the patient. And they, you know, of course, they, they went around it and said, oh, no, we're just making sure that whoever did, and they call it the substantive portion of the visit is the one who, who gets credit. Now that I get, absolutely. If you've got, you know, two providers, one physician, MD or DO, and then one mid-level provider, and remember, that's an NPP. Some of you call them APPs, advanced practice providers. I call them NPPs, non-physician practitioners, who also are the qualified healthcare professionals. Those are um, PAs, nurse practitioners practitioners, clinical nurse specialists who can bill directly to Medicare. If they're shared in a visit with an MD or DO, then it's considered one visit, as you know. But how do you split up that visit? How do you basically determine who gets credit? Well, it's always really been who that always really been the physician if they had any involvement, which was the old rule. Well, now the effective date 1-1-2022 issued 114, and then implementation on 2-15-2022. Here's the new definition of the splitter shared visit. So it says a splitter shared visit is an evaluation and management visit in the facility setting. So that means hospital or facility. So it says that is performed in part both by the physician and an NPP, non-physician practitioner, who are in the same group in accordance with applicable law and regulations such that the service could be billed by either the physician or NPP if furnished independently by only one of them. So they're basically saying you have to be able to bill Medicare to be able to participate in this split or shared visit. And then it goes on to say payment is made to the practitioner who performs the substantive portion of the visit. Okay, so now we've got to figure out what that means. And this is where it gets dicey that I just want to expand on a podcast that I did not the last time, but the time before. And they'll go on to say facility setting means institutional setting in which payment for services and supplies is um, for the professional services is prohibited under our regulations. So they're saying that it's not 
uh, this, there's no, and actually it says it in the rule. It actually says office visits are not billable as split or shared visits. So for Medicare, what the CPT book says now, remember, you can't use that uh, as far as under the 99202 to 205 and 99212 to 215. So that's been changed. So any split or shared visits in the office setting that you were allowing before, make sure you know you can't allow that anymore, which actually is going to make life easier for many of us because I was getting a lot of generic statements from a lot of my providers that were doing this and um, it, it just said that they always had a nurse practitioner PA participating and I had to keep explaining to them and admonishing them for doing that because one thing we don't want to do is have vague or misleading or generic statements just to be able to capture a service. We need exact information. That's why when a doctor says, you know, I spent greater than 40 minutes with the patient, how much greater? You know, so those kinds of things we have to be very careful of. The, the whole point of some of these updates is to get exact and to be individualized with the patient. But here's where it goes into definition of su substantive portion. And what I'm looking at, in case some of you are looking at the actual uh, rules, you're looking at the Medicare manual section 30.6.18, split or shared visits. Okay, and this is a revision 11181, and they talk about implementation again on 215. So here's the definition. It says more than half the total time. So first of all, they talk about what is happening in January 2023. Substantive portion means more than half of the total time spent by the physician and NPP performing the split or shared visit. Now they call 2022 the transitional year from January 1st to December 31st of this year. They say except for critical care visits, okay, so that has its own new rules. The substantive portion can be one of three key e &M visit components. Remember, we're still at the 9597 guidelines in the hospital setting. It says history, exam, or medical decision making, or more than half of the total time spent by the physician and NPP performing the split or shared visits. So it says, in other words, for calendar year 2022, the practitioner who spends more than half of the total time or performs the history exam or medical decision making, and they call it either one in totality, so you have to complete all components, can be considered to have performed the substantive portion and can bill for the split or shared visits. Okay, so then it goes on um, to talk about, again, the entire, um, in its entirety to bill if you're using medical decision making. Um, for They use an example of history as used as the, as the substantive portion. Uh, and both practitioners take part in the history. The billing practitioner must perform the level of history required to select the level of visit. Now, I would really hope that medical decision making is used as the su substantive visit or portion because this gets really dicey if it isn't. Now, here's where this is what I don't like. <laughs> and this is what's making me crazy. And you're going to hear my head explode on this. And when I talk about this episode is what is Medicare thinking I'm going to bring something to your attention and I feel, God, I feel like Joe Rogan today. I'm going to be a little controversial because I get a lot of providers and I'm sure your doctor does this to you as well. A lot of clients that say, well, if it's in writing, I'm doing it. But just because you can, should you? I like to see practices that take a rule and say, you know what? We're going to do best practices because this doesn't smell right to us. And so for malpractice reasons, for liability, and just plain bed, you know, best practices on what you do as a physician in your office. I hope that you are more strict than what this is allowing. So I, I hate this rule. I absolutely hate it. I actually said that to somebody this weekend because this rule is going to foster and going to prompt fraud, in my opinion. And I just don't like it when that's even an option, when it's even, you know, it could even target a physician. And not, and to me, not really any of their fault, more that, well, if they're gonna let us do it, we're gonna do it. It's kind of like what we're seeing right now with telehealth, when I see providers billing for things they never did before, and now they're like, well, why can't I do that? So when you have a provider that says, if the, the rules say that I can do it, then I'm going to do it instead of the rules don't make sense. So even though it's in our back pocket there and we have it in our compliance manual, let's do what's right. So I'm hoping that when you hear the rest of this, that you'll understand that you, hopefully you'll do what's right and not what they're allowing you to do. And you'll see what I mean here. So distinct time. It says in accordance with CPT guidelines, only distinct time can be counted. When the practitioner jointly, practitioners jointly meet or with or discuss the patient, 
Only the time of one of the practitioners can be counted. I find this interesting that they're referring back to CPT guidelines right, when right above the, the distinct time section, it says office visits are not billable as split or shared visits. So then I go to my CPT book on page seven on the, on the uh, right hand side and under split or shared visit, it does talk about the one practitioner. It basically says that when time is being used to select the appropriate level service, and it talks about the time personally spent by each provider and they on the same patient, they sum that total time. And then it also goes on to say only distinct time should be summed for split or shared visits. When two or more individuals jointly meet with the, with or discuss the patient, only the time of one individual should be counted. So yes, I agree with that. And this is where we're going to get into a controversy. But the problem is that's under the heading of office visits. And so if they're saying, well, office visits are not billable, how are they using the office visits rules to apply to this? Now, I want to, but it's getting a little bit controversial because then right underneath that, it says, um, where does it talk about this? It says time may be only used for selecting a level of service and other services will use different times. So it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> we've got a little bit different controversy here because different categories of service use time differently. And so I'm looking now at page eight in my CPT book, and here's what it says for outpatient facilities. So for consultations, um, for the, you know, Medicare doesn't allow those, but they do allow rest home, nursing home, um, things like that. It says face-to-face -face time must, is, must be there. But if you look at hospital services, so if you're in observation, inpatient or outpatient, which is what they were talking about, it says for coding purposes, time for these services is defined as unit or floor time, which includes the time spent on the patient's hospital unit and at bedside rendering services for that patient. Okay, so and at bedside. To me, that's face to face, right? Not so fast. Here's where my head's exploding. So here's where it talks about the qualifying time. It says, and again, they always say except for critical care because it has its own rules, preparing to see the patient. And it also talks about uh, when performed and whether or not the activities involve direct patient contact. This is such an out here. This is going to be a problem. Preparing to see the patient, review of tests, obtaining or reviewing separately obtained history, performing medically appropriate exam and or evaluation, counseling and education, the patient's family, caregiver, patient, ordering medications. What does this sound like? This sounds going back to the office visits, right? Independently reviewing, interp interpreting test results, not separately reported. Care coordination, not separately reported. So it's just when I'm listening to this or reading through this, I'm just like, okay, you guys are mixing your what is approved and what isn't and what is office visits and what's hospital. Now here's the section 30.6.12, and this is for determining the substantive portion. And this is where Michelle brought this to my attention. I must have read it 20 times, and I was talking about this with my husband, and Tom's like, this makes no sense. Do you see what's going to happen? I go, I exactly see what's going to happen. So here's what it says. For all split or shared visits, and I highlighted it, it's on the last part of this in red. It says one of the practitioners must have a face-to-face, in-person contact with the patient, but it does not necessarily have to be the physician nor the practitioner who performs this substantive portion and bills for the visit. What? The substantive portion can be entirely with or without direct patient contact and is determined by the portion proportion of total time whether that not whether the time involves patient contact and I'm now I'm going to laugh because that's ridiculous so let's let's talk about a scenario let's say you have a scenario where you've got a nurse practitioner that is spending let's say 20 minutes with the patient doing a history and exam and let's say they didn't do it in their entirety they did a portion of it and then let's say the physician now is called by the uh, by the uh, nurse practitioner who saw the patient maybe there's a video audio video maybe there isn't who knows and that practitioner is at bedside because they have to have it face to face with the patient there has to be at least one and so let's say that they're going over things but the physician is only on the phone and so now the the nurse practitioner had that 20 minutes let's say that over the phone consultation um, took another 22 minutes Okay, well, who gets credit for that? The doctor's not there, 
only the nurse practitioner's there. It doesn't say which practitioner gets that. So because the doctor's liable, do they get the 22 minutes and then the nurse practitioner gets 20? Or does the nurse practitioner get 42 minutes because they get the time that they were actually in front of the patient, the doctor wasn't, but wasn't the medical decision making the, the substantive portion? And didn't the physician actually do that? This is where it's making me crazy. Let's pretend that the doctor actually went over there. And what, let's say that the nurse practitioner did all the work up for the patient, spent 20 minutes, the doctor did, uh, was in a uh, person with that patient, which I pr- that should be best practices, spent an additional, let's say, 15 minutes doing the, the visit, the exam, um, finishing up the exam, let's say, but the whole medical decision making in the entirety only took 15 minutes. And then the doctor leaves to go see another patient. And then the nurse practitioner did the rest. They were standing by in the room to be kept in the loop. But they did all of the workup and then they did the the follow-up for another five minutes. Well, in that scenario, the doctor doesn't get to bill for it, even if they saw the patient because they didn't have the they didn't have the substantive portion. The nurse practitioner did. They and they had more time. And who's gonna be the time police? Are they gonna come look at these? You bet they are, because now we also have a new modifier for any shared visits. Doesn't matter if it's your doctor that did it, doesn't matter if it is the nurse practitioner or PA, it has to have an FS modifier. F is in Frank, S is in Sam. So all shared visits, because they're gonna track them. That's what those modifiers are for, for tracking. And then they just talk about in 2023, it's just gonna be about time. This is really sad because to me, and when I say sad, this is this is Medicare. What were you thinking? What if your physician, let's say, did um, you know all of the front work? Let's say they ordered medications, ordered tests, procedures, talked to other healthcare professionals, and then also then your let's say that your nurse practitioner or PA did the did the whole you know exam with that patient was the only one that was in face to face in person. And then the, um, the provider basically from their office, didn't ever see the patient use more time with, you know, doing the the follow-up. So basically said, okay, so do this, this, and this. And then all of that was a sum to give the physician more time. And then the doctor still never saw the patient. So it says you can use either, or you can use either substantive based on history, exam, medical decision-making, or in the transition year, you can use time. So, I can see physicians never wanting to leave their office. I had a heated discussion with one of my client physicians, oh, oh my gosh, probably about three years ago, saying, don't do that. I was concerned because I couldn't tell whether he was going to the hospital and seeing patients under the old rules or if he was just letting his mid-level provider do everything and there was just a phone conversation and he was trying to bill it out under himself. And I'm like, you can't do that. Well, guess what? Now they're saying that there's a possibility you could do that. And this is where it gets me very crazy is because in actually, for example, the WPS handout, it said only one practitioner has to have face-to-face and it doesn't have to be the billing practitioner. And when you say no face-to-face is required, why would a doctor ever go to the hospital? Except it is appropriate to go to the hospital. You basically, you you can't basically, in, okay, now this is an opinion. This is my professional opinion. How can you support a hospital visit for a patient when you never saw them in the hospital? This isn't anything to do with the public health emergency or telehealth or anything. This is in the Medicare manual is permanent where they're saying, oh, you know what? They're discounting the visit or the, the I guess should say the, the presence of a physician with a patient. They're saying that, you know what? If the nurse practitioner is there, then, then at least you covered your bases on the rules. And again, to me, it should have been or they're trying to get where they're only paying 85%. But when you look at this rule, if the doctor actually timed the visit and they have more time, then they're going to get credit for that. So they put in an example here. They have, if the NP spent the first 10 minutes with the patient and the physician then, then, then spent another 15, their individual time spent would equal a total of 25 minutes. Okay, the physician would bill for this visit since they spent more than half the total time. But what if it, what if it was reversed? Then the NPP gets it. Well, you know, a doctor's not going to allow that to happen. They're going to find a reason to put an extra five minutes in there. They said if the same situation, 
if the physician or NPP met together for an additional five minutes beyond the 25 minutes to discuss the patient's treatment plan, that overlapping time could only be counted once for purposes of establishing total time and who provided the substantive portion of the visit. They said the total time would be 30 minutes and the physician would bill for the visit since they spent more than half the total time, 20 of the 30 minutes. But they're not saying who gets credit for that overlapping time. It's basically... In my opinion, it should be the physician if they're there in person, but that's not what this says. And so as much as I hate it, I have to bring it to your attention. But for those of you that are listening this week, please go back and read the rules on this. Read them until you can't read them anymore. And then I would like some info. I would like some feedback. So DM me on Twitter find me, just tell me how you're reading this and actually bring it to your physician's attention. If you feel safe to do that and you know your physician would do what's best practices and then basically say, okay, we as a, as a practice need to have a policy because I even have physicians that don't feel like their nurse practitioner PA can see a patient in the office, but in the hospital, if patients are sick enough to be in the hospital, how could this be okay? How can they not see a physician? And again, I'm not saying that I'm not discounting the work of PAs or nurse practitioners. We need them. And they are amazing pract- providers. But to say that a nurse practitioner or PA having a face-to-face with a patient is better or is, how do I put it, um, is basically equal to having a physician there doesn't make sense. So this is where you have to have a face-to-face, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the physician. Who does that? So Medicare, what are you thinking? This really, really bothers me. And so I guess I'm, I'm, I am Joe Rogan this week. So it's just, you know, I, I just have such a hard time with this because my job as not just a consultant, but as an auditor and somebody who has a membership for clients where I write appeal letters for you. Again, if you ever want to join my coding corner, it's on my my website at terryfletcher.net. But let's say that you're having one of these visits was denied for noncompliance. Well, I will not appeal that for you if I can't support it. And also, if I don't feel, I guess I'm looking at a moral objectivity here, and it's just, it's just who I am. If, if you have a physician that did the face-to-face and you have everything else documented well, I'm absolutely in support of that you did the substantive portion if you're basing it on time. Or if I have documentation that reflects that the physician did the um, one of the uh, history, one of the elements, history, exam, or medical decision making, then I'm supportive. I'll I'll totally support you in billing that on the physician if the physician had the face to face. So I'm actually stretching the rule where if you bring me something and saying, hey, the payer saying the doctor wasn't there, but the rules say that they don't have to be, can you help us appeal this? Don't come to me because I don't like this. I think it's wrong. Even though it's the letter of the law, you're going to be on your own to appeal that and good luck. I wouldn't want to have malpractice insurance under this. Let me give you in a scenario. So let's say a patient comes in, I'll give you two scenarios and they have chest pain and shortness of breath. And the PA is seeing the patient on admission. Your doctor's in the office seeing a bunch of patients. And that patient um, gives information to the PA. And a lot of patients do that with the anticipation the doctor's going to see them at some point. So maybe they don't tell them everything. The doctor never sees them. It's only uh, collaborative information over the phone or, you know, through a FaceTime call or whatever. So they never see them face to face. Turns out they both collaborate and say, you know what, based on the information we got, patient goes home. They said, you know, we think it's just maybe indigestion. We don't think it's cardiac related. Patient goes home, has a cardiac event and dies. Okay. Who's responsible? You better believe that's the physician. In person, maybe there was something that the doctor could have picked up on. You know, I I had a recent um, conversation with a neurologist that said the patient had over a year of telehealth services and was still having some trouble. They couldn't figure why. Finally, the patient between vaccine and boosted came in and had their visit, felt safe enough to come in. And he said, just the patient getting up out of the chair, they fell immediately. Patient was then diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's that nothing you can see on a telehealth visit because every telehealth visit the patient was in their comfortable recliner. They weren't in a chair that had to make them get up and it didn't help them get up. So the patient with assistance had a problem. Think of another scenario. What about a patient who's admitted for 
um, let's say that they're going in and they've got um, a breast mass or they've got uh, an inner thigh groin mass. And you've heard me tell the story of my father-in-law who passed away from not getting diagnosed appropriately. Well, let's say that they go in, the mid-level provider misses something on a face-to-face -face exam, maybe some oozing, maybe a, a palpable mass that the doctor would have caught and then just says, you know, we're going to give you a topical ointment. It's really just a rash or a reaction to one of your medications. And we're going to send you on your way. They still had maybe some collaborative conversation with the physician, but they, they basically build it out either under themselves, or let's say the doctor said, you know, we had more time on the non face-to-face -face stuff. Patient goes home six months later, they find they've got Hodgkin's lymphoma and nobody caught it because the doctor never saw the patient in person. This is also my argument with telehealth being, you know, um, a replacement for in person. It isn't. So here's where my problem is with this shared visit. If the patient is sick enough, in my opinion, and this is my professional opinion, the patient should be seen by the physician. Again, we appreciate our mid-level providers and all the work they do, but let's finish it up with the physician. Even if it ends up being billed out by the nurse practitioner or PA, at least the doctor had that face-to-face. -face. That's what I would recommend, even though the rules have changed and been modified. So I'm going to, you know, I'm giving you the rule, the 30.6.12, whatever business risk you want to take on that is entirely up to you. I wouldn't recommend to do what they're saying here. So just because it's in the rules, it's kind of giving you an out, but it doesn't mean you have to do it. And that's what I'm going to leave that with you today, because it's driving me crazy. And I know I went long, but I just thought this was so important not to let it go. And so I really look forward to everybody's feedback. So, oh my goodness, I'm ready for a little private information or my private tidbit or my personal tidbit this week. So I do get to visit my daughter. We're fig finishing up our, our wedding information and wedding vendors and all that. So that's kind of a fun thing. So I'm excited to go to Arizona when it's only 68 and 70 degrees. How exciting is that um, this weekend? So I'm happy about that. But um, also, it, what an interesting week of playoff football. Did anybody watch? Can you believe that we're going to see a Ram Cincinnati? I mean, who'd have thunk? So that's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be the most unwatched football game um, ever when it comes to um, the Super Bowl. So we'll, we'll see how that pans out. But everyone, make it a great day and a great week. Thank you for listening to my rant on this. I wanted to make sure you had the information. Once again, thank you to Michelle Weiss. I appreciate you uh, sending me over what your comments were and also uh, the cut and paste of that rule that I had to go research and look up even further. And then also to all the people out there and the listeners who have been uh, just so gracious with a lot of the um, comments I've been getting lately. It's just been great. And we are almost up to 300,000 downloads and listeners. So make it a great week and make it a great day. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer, Joe Kuzma. Music producer, Assassin Music.